nine o'clock. I was going to say a one, but it's nine o'clock <laughs> on my laptop. Um, welcome to the Simsbury Board of Selectmen budget workshop. This is a regular meeting. Today is March 12, 2022. And we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. If Heather would get in here with her coffee. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Um, so we, we start every meeting with public audience, and um, as you'll see in the next couple of weeks, we're going to make some changes to that. But I want to welcome everybody for coming here today to represent your board commission, to listen, to participate, and to the board of selectmen, Maria, Melissa, Amy, who are going to be spending Thursday night, Saturday, Monday, Wednesday, <laughs> multiple days in a row talking about um, the town's budget and doing the best that we can to keep them very affordable and to provide the services that we all need and love. So with that, I'm going to start with um, some written comments that we received from uh, Morgan <coughs> Hilliard from the, uh, as the executive director of the Simsbury Chamber of Commerce. Dear Board of Selectmen and Town Management, thank you for reading this statement in my absence today. I would like to take the opportunity to briefly describe the beneficial services of the Simsbury Chamber of Commerce provides the town as they pertain to a request for increased funding for the upcoming fiscal year 22-23. The Simsbury Chamber of Commerce manages the town visitor center and we interact with thousands of people that come to enjoy the area. We have noticed that many of the visitors are interested in moving to Simsbury and or opening a business and we provide them with information, resources, and contacts to encourage them to continue to explore those opportunities. In addition to those looking to move to the area, we have noticed an increase of tourists attracted to the unique charm of Simsbury. The Chamber staff of two is always dedicated to promoting our local businesses, accommodations, and restaurants to the individuals visiting to ensure they return for seasons to come. The Chamber has designated a newly enhanced community guide to distribute at the Visitor Center. This guide is a more comprehensive tourism resource and includes information on town departments, other local organizations, historical and agricultural attractions, and our popular outdoor activities such as hiking and biking trails. The guide also has information about the business in town and the community events. The Simsbury Chamber of Commerce has increased the number of community events in town and upon approval from the appropriate department, we promote several of these events as in partnership with the town of Simsbury. We are thrilled about the level of collaboration we have with the town and very much value this supportive relationship. Community events we organize and staff are designated to enrich the residential community, attract new families to the area and highlight our various small businesses. We have also increased our collaborations with small local nonprofits which the Chamber feels enhance the quality of life for Simsbury residents and encourages a diverse and inclusive culture. Little more. The Chamber of Commerce benefits the local economy in far more ways than I have addressed here. The grant funds request is specifically to assist us with staff hours used to accommodate the increased tourism at the Visitor Center, costs of the newly enhanced community guide, and expenses related to the community events that attract thousands. In conclusion, the Simsbury Chamber of Commerce serves as a leader in the community by providing a platform for businesses to connect, grow, and thrive. The organization is dedicated to increasing tourism and promoting the business and residential communities through events throughout the year. Lastly, the Chamber has played a vital ro role during COVID to support business visibility, keep professionals connected, and educate business owners on essential resources during this difficult time. And it was signed by Morgan Hilliard. And with that, we're going to move back into the budget. And can oh. we just also, if there were anybody here. Oh, is anybody here for public audience? Oh, hi. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> hey. Do we from here? Or do we oh, we're here at the podium. With the microphone. Get up there. <laughs> Ah, that's all I don't need is a microphone. <laughs> Good morning to all. Uh, my name is David Bush. I am the chairman of Park and Rec. I live at 4 Catherine Lane here in Simsbury. I would like to start by thanking all of the Board of Selectmen for the amount of time and effort you put into uh, helping us here in the town, in particular into the budget. I'm here to advocate, though, that there is one key item in the budget this year for Park and Rec that has to be funded, and that is the irrigation system for the golf course. This has been deferred for many, many years, and your one, number one moneymaker for Park and Rec is your golf course. If we were to lose the irrigation system, you would lose your entire revenue source uh, for uh, the, the golfers and the, and the general community. This is a project that uh, is well beyond its useful life, 
And so I know there are many competing interests in your budget, but I would ask that, um, that, that you fund this project. It's one that needs to be done. And then also Tom uh, Tabersky has outlined other projects that are all really routine maintenance. And one of the things the town has done a very good job recently is routine or preventative maintenance. Buildings wear out, roofs wear out, things need to be replaced. Please fund uh, the budget for the Park and Rec Commission. Thank you. Thanks, Dave. Anybody else? Okay, now we will start um, with turn the budget conversation over to Maria and her team. Great, thank you. Um, thanks everybody for joining us this morning. Um, we were able to follow up on a few of the questions you had from Thursday evening. Um, Melissa did send an email to you all yesterday, so I hope you had the chance to take a look at that. Um, and then leading off with our presentation this morning, we have Lisa Kramer, our library director. Well, good morning everyone. Good morning. Um, I'm here this morning to present to you the library budget, but first I would like to introduce some people that I have in the audience this morning who are avid library supporters. We have the president of the Friends of the Library, Greg Galinsky, past president of the Library Board of Trustees, Marianne O'Neill, and the vice chair of the library board right now, Polly Rice, and uh, Holly McGrath, who is the corresponding secretary for the library board, and Susan Rubenstein, who is one of our new trustees. So thank you all for coming this morning. Um, all right, so the total proposed operating budget for the library for next year is $1,801,084, or an increase of $65,483, which is a 3.8%. that personnel salaries are 73% of the library budget. Do you want to move forward, Melissa? Thank you. Um, so our areas of focus is, one of them is always increasing library engagement. Um, and one of the ways we do that is increasing the number of library card holders. I can share with you that across the state, the number of library card holders has been decreasing since the pandemic. And it's about, the average is about 37% right now. But here in Simsbury, we are very proud that 53% of our residents actually hold library cards. However, to us at the library, what that means is there are 47% of people that don't use the library. So engagement is something that we focus on all the time. Um, and we also just did our strategic plan um, and we'll be presenting that strategic plan to you on April 25th, but we got a lot of feedback as part of that process, and it was clear that our outreach and our engagement um, opportunities that we provide was one of the most important services that we do provide to the town because it helps people know what we have to offer. And as we all know, sitting in this room, the library is much more than books now, and some people still need to be made aware of what we do. Um, in fact, this year we'll be rolling out our book bike that we purchased with ARPA funds, so we'll be taking the library out. Um, let's see. Thank you. As I've said, the library is people. So continuing to invest in the development of the library staff is pivotal. Um, and we've started to cross train over the past few years. And I can tell you right now that that has been invaluable to us. We have a number of people, key people out on leave at the time, at this time. And if we had not cross trained people, we would be crippled at this point. So it has been really valuable. Um, and then last year, we used our continuing education conference money, since people could not travel, to do a series of five uh, equity, diversity, and inclusion workshops with the staff. And um, we then started incorporating all of that EDI work into the services and programs that we provide at the library to make it a more welcoming place to everyone in town. And we know that that's an important part of our town here because we're a welcoming community. And that was also one of the things that we found in our strategic planning process, that um, the community, whereas our past current uh, strategic plan talked about celebrating diversity, now it says that we welcome diversity and we're part of that inclusive environment. Um, <clears throat> sorry. Um, Sorry, lost my train of thought. <laughs> One of the things that we were recognized for last year, um, we won the Connecticut Library Association Excellence in Public Library Service Award for the equity, diversity, and inclusion work that we have done with the Spirit Council. So we're very proud of that as well. And the library board also adopted for the library staff um, and the library in general an EDI statement, which is part of that strategic plan that we did. Thank you. 
And as we know, coming out of the pandemic, supporting job seekers and businesses and the local economy is hugely important. So that is one of our other areas of focus for this year that we will continue to do. And we'll talk about that some more when we get further into the slides. Thank you. Um, so $34,689 is full-time salaries, um, contractual obligations. And again, you see that the library is people and that is our biggest budget driver. And these people that staff the library, they're people that have expanded library service thanks to the pandemic. It sort of pushed us into expanding services. We started curbside pickup during the pandemic and that is something that will continue going forward. Um, and we also started hybrid programming most recently as an offshoot of virtual programming that we did during the pandemic, and that will continue going into perpetuity as well. <clears throat> we have a $3,542 increase due to minimum wage. Again, libraries, people. And then the cost of processing supplies for all the materials we get in to get ready for the shelf has gone up, so we have a $914 increase there. And then I'm happy to report we have a reduction because we went out um, and searched for another calendar and room management software and saved $1,300. And um, as you know, room management at the library is one of the pivotal things that we do for the community. Thank you. We have an increase in equipment maintenance um, due to the annual maintenance fees for the pickup lockers, which we'll be having a ribbon cutting for on the 31st, and you will all get an invitation. But that will help the workflow and help the library staff to more efficiently handle that curbside pickup service that's become so popular. And also in that equipment maintenance increase is uh, additional Wi-Fi hotspots. Wi-Fi hotspots at the library are one of the most borrowed things from the Library of Things. They help people work remotely. They help with online school. Um, they give equitable access to people in the community who either a, can't afford internet access or their access at home is just not sufficient enough to work remotely. So um, I can share with you also that we got a grant from the Emergency Connectivity Fund to have 10 additional Wi-Fi hotspots that will be available to lend soon. And also the friends of the library have generously uh, gifted us three Chromebooks and three Wi-Fi hotspots that will be lent together. So watch for those coming soon. We also have a $2,600 increase in databases due to contractual increases. And um, just to share with you some of the databases that we offer, we have Business Plan Builder Pro. So some entrepreneur who's starting a business can come and use Business Plan Builder Pro to create their business plan, do projections, do outlooks. Um, we also have Job Now, which is an online job assistance tool. And you can actually meet one-on-one -on -one and chat and do a, like a practice interview with someone through Job Now. We also have the Value Line Investment Tool and Morningstar for people to keep track of their investments. And we have the New York Times Online, which is something that we just started getting this past year. And we also have Universal Class, which offers about 500 continuing education classes from accounting to photography to calligraphy to almost anything you can think of for those hoping to build job skills. And then, of course, our um, anticipated increases in utility costs. Thanks, Melissa. And then we do have one CNR project. It's a project that we talked about last year, creating a technology replacement plan for public PCs at the library. Um, for this year, it's $15,120. One of the um, slew of PCs that we need to replace at the library on a regular basis is in the tech lab, because we do use that for hands-on technical programming for people who are looking for job skills. Um, and it's very heavily used. Um, and actually, the um, Public PCs of the library are one of our most heavily used services. Pre-pandemic, about 85,000 sessions annually on those PCs, and it's gone up as high as about 120,000 annual sessions on those PCs. Um, and that is my presentation for this morning, so I'm happy to answer questions. Um, I'm going to open up anybody. I have um, first of all, I just wanted to say, you know, thanks so much to the library. I, I know it was a really invaluable resource during the pandemic and that you and the staff worked really hard to make things accessible to the public. And it was really a lifeline that I think people appreciated. I wanted to ask about the programming. Is everything pretty much back in person or are or, or, and, and back to a pre-pandemic level of programming? We are not back to a pre-pandemic level of programming. Everything is not back to in-person programming. The children's department, for the most part, is back to in-person programming. The adult department, because a lot of our 
program attendees, our seniors, has not gone totally open to have mm -hmm. in-person programs mm -hmm. yet. We've actually been doing some of them hybrid. Mm -hmm. So okay. we will get there eventually. Right, right. So and we will include that hybrid option as well. Right, which will be a great option yes. to have going forward. So, okay. I foresee in-person programs coming very soon. Okay. All right. Oh, go ahead. Um, and I also would like to say thank you uh, so much for all that the library does as a past board member and being very involved in the strategic plan. I can attest to um, how much work you do to really understand the community's needs and try and meet those needs. Um, so thank you for that. And um, my question is just on the entrepreneur side. So. Are you, you know, what are you seeing as increases and especially uh, kind of use of co-working spaces there um, just due to the pandemic? I would say that most recently we see more people coming into that co-working space. And we also, more importantly, see people using it as a remote working space. Okay. And we saw that through the pandemic once we opened again because people were looking for a way to get out of their house and see people. <laughs> Even if they were not working in a room with them, they got out to see people. And do you anticipate that to continue? I do. Okay. I do. And, and if you look at our circulation figures and our number of visits, you'll see that we're slowly creeping back to the normal that we had pre-COVID. Um, I can also share with you that uh, recently we had someone that needed to take a mental health day from their job because they were just overcome with a toxic work environment, and they chose the library to come to to do remote work that day. So they used our Wi-Fi, they used our resources, they used our space. Mm -hmm. So it's also a sanctuary. Did you want to go? Just to follow up on the co-working, um, Hartford opens up next week, so it'll be interesting to see what the trend looks like yep. with the, the mm -hmm. you know, folks looking to remote. I agree with you, I think uh, a lot of employers have um, divested of their yes. uh, you know, physical footprint, but mm -hmm. the big employers are still requiring folks to come down the town, trust me. Um, so we'll, it'll be interesting to see what, uh, what happens next week. And we did add a new, new. it was an office that we made into an additional conference room, which is also heavily used, because okay. we did not have enough small co-working spaces that could be shut away. And then just the second one is, so the strategic plan's coming to us in April. Yes. This funding request is in line with that, or yes. there's going to be additional funding? Nope. Okay. okay, okay. Perfect. To follow up on those two on the... Um, are, are you? I know you're seeing expanded use of the co-working spaces, but do we? Is there still re space available? Like, do you see it full all the time? Is there a s space for people to secure and come in and work going forward at this point? You know, unless it changes. Well, I would say it's not full at this time. Okay. But we do see people coming back, and eventually, I do anticipate it being full. And if you haven't stopped in the business and career center since the pandemic, we've totally gutted it, moved the collection into the entire collection, and it is completely now a co-working space. So there is room okay. for people. Could we use more space? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, a couple other questions. Um, one, one is the um, business center, um, re the business resource coordinator. Have we filled that position? Is that still open? It is still open. Okay. Um, is there a projection on potential hiring to fill that, or, or you guys are all filling in for that position? We are sort of pitch hitting for that position at the moment. Um, the adult services department has been handling programming, but we do we have promoted it. Um, it's out there. It will remain open until filled. It's a very highly specialized position because you need that business expertise hand in hand with a library science degree. Because I personally think it's important for that individual to understand library services. Okay, so that they're they're still in the budget. Yes. Um, and then you mentioned we had people that were out. Like, are we missing a lot of people are on leave? Are we? Are you down a lot of people right now? Yes, you are. We are. Is there just a number? Like, like <laughs> out of the number? We have three full-time people that were down at the moment. Okay, um, but it is temporary. Okay, temporary. And then the last question is, um, how are how's the use of the loan lockers going? We actually haven't rolled them out yet. Okay. Look for a soft, I shouldn't say this, but look for a soft rollout this week or next. <laughs> they are incredibly easy to use, incredibly easy to use. But of course, with anything that we provide, the staff is always willing to help. Okay, I do have one more question. Sorry, I can't take us to the chair. Um, the data, you mentioned all these databases that you have available. Um, not that I know if I need any, but, it, and I don't go to your the library website a lot, but do, how, do people know that those are out there? Do we push that information out there so you don't have to buy that software? You can go in and use it? Is that we do push that information out through social media, okay. on web page sliders. We have postings in the library. I, 
obviously, um, and they're all available remotely. I should have said that, so you okay. can use those 24/7 from your home, okay, or from the library parking lot if you're using yeah, the Wi-Fi. Wi okay. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Sure. Just a quick question on um, on the two uh, the library cards. You said about a little over half of our residents are engaged with the library. Yes. Is that in is that better or in line with other communities that are similar to Simsbury? As I said. Um, 37% is the average for okay. the state. Simsbury is actually higher than, than our comparable libraries. Gotcha. And can you talk a little bit about the relationship with the Friends and what their funding allows you to do? Absolutely. Um, we look to the Friends of the Library for additional support that's over and ab that allows us to do things over and above what the town provides. You know, the town provides the bricks, the mortar, the technology, those basic inherent services. But the Friends, um, one of the things that they provide that's over and above is support for the fish tank in the children's room. And if you've had a child in the children's room with you, you know that the fish tank is super important to them. They provide certain projects uh, like the Story Walk. Mm which we were very grateful for and was perfect to roll out during the pandemic since it was an outside activity. They are, as I mentioned, providing the three Chromebooks and three Wi-Fi hotspots that will be available to circulate. They provide all of the funding for the summer reading program. So without them, the summer reading program would not be the tantamount library program of the year. So things like that. So two quick ones. Um, I assume we're coordinating with, with Rick on the computer replacement schedule? Yes. Okay. Cool. And then, I know it's not in this year's, but given your comments on the co-working design space in the out years, there's projects. So if there's not, we're not at full capacity now, are we looking at changing that out, looking at that differently? Because there's, there's, a, there's a pot of money for co-working design space phase, and it sounds like you've already done that. We've done it like in a baby step. It's not truly a co-working space at the moment, but you know, we gutted the collection and moved it into the full collection. We um, purchased new furniture, but it's not. And we want to optimize the space. We also know that we need more meeting rooms that can be shut off and be private. So there are options that we could do that are modular that could go <coughs> into that space. So we need someone to come in and look to see how we can maximize the use of our space because we've run out of space in the physical building and really there's nowhere to expand so we need to have help with how we use the space okay so well, we won't talk about it anymore this year but next year at 9 25 i would love to have some data on the, sure. the past year yeah. or the coming year of co-working space how sure. it's been utilized yeah etc so we can we can make a decision on that absolutely thanks i have one more question uh, uh, so um, there, we talked about this a little bit last year, uh, that how the Terrafield Library, the school used to open summers mm -hmm. um, and be a, like a branch. And I don't know, is that um, something that's been discussed with the library board, with anybody as a potential need or desire? And, and do you see, um, you know, like interest in, in, in something like that? Well, the Terrafield Library at the elementary school still does open in the summertime. Okay. So we will work in collaboration with Marty okay. to make sure that we have some services there as well. Okay. Um, one of my visions for the future, and we would get there in baby steps, is to increase service to Terrafil. One of the ways that we could do that is putting pickup lockers in Terrafil so people wouldn't have to come all the way into the library to pick up their holds. Mm -hmm. We also that um, four support. Miles is long, I know. <laughs> <laughs> we also support a little free library in Terrafil on the green. Okay. So there are ways we're already working to support Terraville. And once yeah. the bike path is finished, you can ride your bike up there. Right. Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Just, cur yeah, just curious if that was just if we, that's been not now. in the strategic plan, bike but something may come back and ask. Expanding for. our physical space outside of the building is actually part of the strategic plan. Yeah. Okay. Lisa, I forget. Was it twenty or twenty-one? We ad we advocated for about twenty thousand for the. For digital, uh, that increase was two in digital. years ago. Two years ago, did you fully realize all the the purchasing oh, you wanted from that? Well, and get yes, and we could stand more because you'll remember right after that budget workshop, the pandemic. Sure, right, that's why we that's why we pushed so hard right. that summer. So um, the use of our digital content actually almost tripled. Wow. So digital content is something we could always use. So in the for. future. Um, you know, as the library becomes future-proofed, if such a thing exists as first consumers, how, how much do you see a, a, a dollar being spent towards a hard book versus 
a digital resource? Is the trend going to be continuing shifting towards digital, or is it always do librarians always see it as a, as a balance between access? Personally, I expect it to tip much sooner than now. I'm, I can't anticipate when it will completely tip to digital, but if we continue to have pandemics, it will certainly help push that way. What we have seen is a shift from books on CD to streaming content mm -hmm. and DVDs to streaming content. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about Rick's presentation of the night about um, moving to our, our IT costs are going to increase because the IT world has figured out the ne next mousetrap, which is subscription based. And, right. and we're basically handcuffed with two services out there. So, so you can one, expect to see a request for that. Yes. In okay. The next so of years. that, and does that mean that publishers uh, who are losing out essentially on a, the, the, Will our will our cost of a book continue to increase uh, be in the towards into the digital world as we convert over, or does digital create a cost um, an expense savings because a book is now digital versus hardbound? Actually, as far as libraries are concerned, digital content is much much more expensive than print content. Mm -hmm. um, there are states right now that are advocating for legislation to make that digital content that's available through companies. Um, to be more cost effective for libraries. Um, the argument, of course, is that authors and publishers lose out on money if libraries are providing content. But I think we've seen through print content that that's not actually the case. Um, the Connecticut Library Association is working with um, Representative Wong right now, or Senator Wong, Senator Wong right now, to draft legislation that will make ebooks more accessible to libraries. And, and, and I know to, a, to, a, to my you know, from naivete, the, the misunderstanding is that the library is about books, which, which is what we're talking about here. It's not about books. It's about much more than books, especially as it relates to the contribution to the sense of community and all. Yes. But could you give me a super basic, you can be wrong by 50%, which is a pretty good error margin, okay? <laughs> uh, but what, it, what would you say is, so for, for just traditional borrowing, Mm -hmm. versus everything else that goes on in the, in the library when it's, as it's open. Of course, it's a 24-7 entity now. Mm -hmm. But what does that break down as far as, is it 20% borrowing and 80% everything else? No, I would say it's probably closer to 40% borrowing 60. And you said I could be off by 50%. That's fine. So. <laughs> you're, now you're at zero. I hate okay, throwing Now you're at zero borrowing like at 99%. 40. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I would say a lot of our use, a great deal of our use, is the meeting rooms and the co-working space. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. So safe to say that, but safe to say as far as the pure borrowing cost, pure the sense of the pure library, that we should be thinking as we as we move into the future that the cost of the library is going to increase as it relates to a book. No, it's not going to be due to a book. No, I'm saying, but as it relates as it relates to buying a book, that cost will continue. So we're going to have to continue to allocate additional monies Absolutely. towards purchasing product, purchasing materials. Materials, yes. And, and okay. um, in preparation for this, you know, I always look at our comparable libraries, and we are still spending less per capita on our material and digital collection than the libraries around us. Mm -hmm. So you can expect to see that there are repercussions for that in our right. circulation so we, numbers. So we will see a reoccurring material, probably a likely re re versus we generally consider to see year over year, which is natural wages as cost increase, which is unavoidable. And we often see technology as a sort of a repeated theme, which is understandable. But which very likely we'll start to see a repeated increase in materials request. As we Which move I think is a much better way to do it than coming to you and saying, hey, we're this far behind, we need $20,000. Oh, so. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Uh, yeah, this is an off the cuff question. Okay. Um, as a community, someone just recently described the library really as our community center. We have the teen room mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And you know, we're gonna be looking later today and Monday and Tuesday at the ARPA funding. Mm -hmm. You know, have there been ideas that have come from your board, from the library board, um, to potentially use the ARPA funds for that would benefit the community at a, as a whole? Do you want me to share what we talked about? Sure. Uh, one of the things that we have talked about using the ARPA funds for is hiring a summer intern to take the book bike to the elementary schools one day each week so that the children can access the library in their own neighborhoods. I love that. And, and again, I made the comment about the three miles to Terrafil. And the reason I make that is because there's a perception that Terrafil is yes. so far away. Mm -hmm. Main Street Terrafil is actually 3.4 miles driving from right here. My house on David Drive is 5.9. 
So I think we've got, un we have potentially, you know, further underserved portions of town, not intentionally, but, you know, yes. again, so taking it out to Tooton, taking it to Latimer, mm -hmm. Squadron, I think is important too. One of the things that we saw in our past strategic planning process, and again, in this strategic planning process, is that those people in Tariffville do not necessarily feel like they live in the town of Simsbury. So we want to make sure that they feel part of that town and part of our services. So that's always in the back of our minds. Did, really important, I agree. Did you say the loan locker, you know, for Tariffville is going to be in a future budget? Is that just curious? It's possible it could be funded with grants. I, yeah, okay. But it's, we like those. But it is a plan. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and Wendy, we did flag that um, for your January ARPA meeting as one of the potential items that, um, again, with staff's <coughs> recommendation, it was perhaps we consider purchasing some literacy equipment, the loan lockers for Tariffville. Okay. Great, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks for coming. You. Yeah. I'm not cutting my library budget, so you guys are good. <laughs> <laughs> we made that mistake once ten years ago. You fought too hard. Yeah. <laughs> Never again. Thank you. I feel so reassured. <laughs> <laughs> I was petrified to drive around town for two weeks. <laughs> okay. Now Tom's budget, that's a whole different story. <laughs> Watch yourself. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that one. Yeah, the library always brings us base goods and stuff. It's, it's all under the gift policy. All good. That's why I'm just waiting for you. It's very rude. I'm here for you. So whenever you're right, whenever right. you're ready. That was my mistake. So, good morning, everyone. Um, for those who, who are watching on TV and don't know, my name is Thomas Tversky. I'm the Culture Parks and Recreation Director, um, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak to you about the Culture Parks and Recreation budget this morning. Um, but before I do, I just want to acknowledge that um, our two division chiefs, my my two right hand men, are in the in the room here. Orlando Casiano is our Park Superintendent. Brian Johnson is our golf superintendent, and I just want to thank, thank David Bush, the chairman of the Culture Park and Recreation Commission, again, for, for his support and uh, for being here this morning. Um, so we've got a lot to talk about. Let's get into it. Wait for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes, cracks. I brought out all the bells and whistles this year. Um, so for those of you who don't know or aren't aware yet, uh, in 2022, we're going to be celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Simsbury Farms. Uh, recreation complex and we have a lot of uh, ideas of what we're going to do to celebrate that but um, anybody anybody who's been here any length of time knows it's a it's truly a gem uh, there's not many communities in the state that have a facility like that and you know the the town uh, forefathers in in the early late 60s early 70s who had the foresight to put that to make that land purchase and put that project together um, it's just done wonders for this community and I think everybody appreciates uh, that foresight and you know, I think we're carrying the torch, uh, the guys, the, the team I have now, we're carrying the torch into the, uh, the next 50 years and, uh, and doing it with uh, lots of enthusiasm. So just a little, <laughs> little history of what was going on in 1972, just to keep, just to keep this light. Uh, Crocodile Rock was the top song of the year. The Godfather was the movie of the year. Um, for science geeks like me, the space shuttle program was, was kicked off basically in 1972 oh by President Nixon at the time. <laughs> And uh, those of you who are my age who didn't play Pong when they were younger, that was my, that was my first video game as well. Um, and a fun fact, tennis balls, I didn't know this, tennis balls yeah. used to be white. They were primarily white, some were black, but because uh, when color TV started, the, the balls were harder to pick up, so they made them yellow so they could show uh -huh. tennis on TV. So, and then the last one, yeah, well, we'll just leave that one where it is with the gas. So. <laughs> Hopefully it'll get better sooner than later. Um, so let's get into the numbers here. Our total operating budget this year, that's, that's our parks budget and our, Simsbury Fund, our Parks and Recreation Fund budget, $3,410,781. And as you can see in the sub points there, we have a lot of moving parts in that budget um, because it's split between the general fund and the revenue fund. Um, there generally our increases this year are going to be driven, and we'll get into this later, but are going to be driven by minimum wage. Uh, our, our fuel and energy costs are going up uh, contractually uh, with what's going on in the world. And um, I believe our supply lines 
uh, that we, we use, we bring in a lot of supplies to the town for, our, for the work we do are constrained and are affected by everything that happens around us. So we're seeing major increases in agricultural supplies, both for our parks division and our golf. Um, we are fortunate that um, we've been doing a pre-buy program for a lot of our ag supplies over the last few years, and, and Brian and Orlando have been taking advantage of that. That's going to save the town a bunch of money uh, this year. Um, these things are increasing day by day. I know Brian just came back from a, 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 a program with his colleagues, and. We're, we're on the street is we're, we're going to be seeing major increases for the next year and a half, two years until things settle down. Um, but fortunately, we're going to we're going to kind of ride out this year and, and we should be good through the end of um, this calendar year before we have to do a pre buy for next year. So go ahead. Any, any questions on this slide on the numbers? Go ahead. Melissa. So our department and thank you for your support. We've added the we last year we added our full time uh, parks maintenance technician. That person uh, has come online. They came online in January. We promoted within our staff for that, and we are backfilling that parks maintenance position hopefully this week or next, um, and we'll be fully staffed at ten parks uh, full time employees. The recreation uh, is our one rec supervisor and our parks our program coordinator that will be hired. Uh, this spring, it was funded the last funded in the last few budgets, but we're just hiring now for it. And our golf course is 6.4. That's four full-time employees and six part-time employees. The part-time employees work uh, April to early November, um, so that's what the desk, that's what the fraction is there for. Go ahead, Melissa. So what we're going to be focusing focusing on in, in this upcoming fiscal year is the diversity of program offerings. Um, we really want to uh, get back to adding more pro adding more program and increasing enrollments post pandemic. We're, taught, we're, we're already adding bus trips. We've added mountain biking classes, dog training. We're going to be adding dog training classes in the ice rink this spring. Mm -hmm. uh, and summer, uh, new summer programs like summer disc golf. We're partnering with the Tower Ridge Disc Golf Course to offer two weeks of summer camp over there and possibly an April vacation program as well. Um, and we also hope to add pickleball lessons this year as well. We'll start off at Simsbury Farms and then hopefully move to Terrafil next year. It's a day and a half to get the pickleball. So we're excited about that, and we're always meeting with new instructors. And, and now that people are kind of coming back, even you know a lot of the instructors had kind of shut down over the last two years, they're coming back to us with new ideas as well. Um, uh, and we're going to be improving the bike trail. We have a lot of fence work. Like we've talked about this for a couple of years now. We have seven miles of fencing, Orlando, on, on the bike trail alone. Um, and most of that's been in the ground for 20 to 25 years now. A lot of it's every time that we get a big windstorm, there's another part of it falling. So we're trying to keep up with that. The tree, the tree work on the on the uh, on the trail, uh, the main trail, and then the side trails as well. Um, and then we're also looking to add additional uh, revenue streams in the ice rink. We've been renting to. We've been very fortunate during the one, one of the fortunate things about the pandemic for us is people needed an outside location. So we've been renting a lot of the park spaces, pavilions. We've had a lot of religious services and other types of meetings in the ice rink. We held a, a library pro, a library program with the bike advisory group last year where they did a bike maintenance uh, seminar in the ice rink last spring. And so we're trying to draw, let people know we have that facility, draw them in and, and create additional revenue streams, that, revenue streams there, as well as um, one of the things I've been hoping to work on for the last three years, it just doesn't happen with staffing and the pandemic, but I really want to create a sponsor gift catalog uh, for the town so we can really start to partner with partner with businesses on uh, who may want to partner with us on events, programs, and facility advertising like rink boards. We had four new rink boards, uh, four local businesses sponsor the rink this year. We've already got two, two additional lined up for later in the spring that we're going to add. Um, and then we get a lot of calls from families and local organizations who may want to contribute a park bench or uh, contribute to a program. So we're kind of formalizing that and something we can easily give them, have it out on the website where they can access it and it'll save me time um, in answering those, <laughs> answering those questions you know, consistently um, if we already have the information out there. So that's something I'm hoping to get done this year. Um, I think it'll be a benefit to us and the end of the town. And on the, on the donation one, speaking of it, I just want to thank the Friends of Simsbury Farms. I, you guys asked a question about the library friends. Yeah. The Friends of Simsbury Farms are, all, are really going to be partnering with us for the 50th anniversary event this year, but they've been phenomenal the last few years. Um, contributions all over the golf course um, at the facility. We're adding that. If, if you saw my uh, Facebook post earlier this winter, they, they're adding an expression swing for us where mother, our parent and child can sit and face each other. So you can actually see the smile on your child's face while you're swinging. Um, it's that was, it's going to be really popular there. We're doing um, some wayfinding signage on, and some, a new welcome sign on the uh, Dave Emmett Jr. Family Fitness Trail. Um, they're uh, looking at a fountain too, Dave, uh, 
Dave, fountain, on the, fountain for, the, for the irrigation pond as well um, to help with algae and control the growth in there. And, uh, but they've been phenomenal partners with us, and I just want to acknowledge them while I, while I have the chance to. Go ahead. So as, as I said before, the main drive, the, the, one of the primary drivers in this year's budget is going to be our minimum wage. Um, we have a lot of seasonal employees, more than any other department. Um, that breaks down to roughly 75 lifeguards, around 20 camp counselors, uh, three or four uh, seasonal ma parks maintenance, and two seasonal maintenance on the golf, on the golf staff as well. Uh, we're seeing two increases, one on July 1st, one on June 1st next year. So they basically hit our summer season on both sides. We typically start training staff around the end of May, early June. So we had to account for that for next year. Um, we, the percentage we used, I think we used an 8.3% projection or 8.33% percent, 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 percent projection to figure out how much money we were, we were going to need. Uh, but that's one of our primary drivers. You're, we're going to see, uh, again, as I mentioned before, agricultural costs are going up, both parks and golf. And then our few our energy increases, Not, and there's nothing we could do about that, unfortunately. But uh, I know Tom Roy and his staff do a great job of, of trying to get us the best price for those, for those items. Go ahead. Um, kind of a unique request in this year's, this year's Simsbury Farms Tech and Program Supply Budget is our rental skates. For those of you who have been around, again, a while, the rink was renovated in 1999. That's when it was complete rebuild. The roof was put on it. And at that time, we bought about 220 or so pairs of rental skates, and that's the brown one, the brown skate on the left. Um, we still have about a little more than half of those skates. I'd say about two-thirds of those skates have kind of made it to this point, but they, ha they have obviously seen better days. It's to the point now where we can't sharpen the blades anymore. They're getting, they're so far down. Um, and some of the boots are starting to deteriorate. We have, per we did purchase about 10 years ago or so, some additional skates. Those are also, um, you know, they don't make things like they used to. Those are also in rough shape. But what we're asking for is your support in buying, basically replacing 50% uh, of the inventory this year and then come back again next year and replace another 50% of the inventory um, so that we'll have everything you know, relatively new and get us through the next 10 to 15 years with those. Tom, we, just, yes. we talked about this offline, I forget. What, what's the, re, is it, are you just trying to soften the, the ask? Or yeah, is that's there, what, that, is was there, my, that was my theory behind it. And obviously we're trying, we always try to be frugal and, and cognizant of, of a major increase. Your, your point is well taken. You know, Chris suggested that, you know, we come back with an ask of, of for the whole 20,000 and replace them all at the same time. Um, certainly there could be some thought there that, uh, you know, you get a lower price, you know, for the more you buy at that point, if, if, where the break even is. Um, or the and, price Sean, and Sean's going to say to you, didn't we just buy some skates <laughs> last year? That's his usual yeah, approach. I, I mean, and, no, actually, I was going to say it's so, disgusting that we haven't replaced yeah, it. Yeah, you know, we, we, we've, had, we've had some uh, – so what I asked for is an additional 9000 this year. We've actually had 1000 in the budget. That buys laces and the, the occasional boot. When you buy boots, these, these skate boots, they're about $120, $125 a piece, $150 maybe, if you have to buy them. Um, individually, so that that thousand dollars doesn't go very far. You can get a bigger, obviously, a bigger price break when you buy more. But the um, what we'd like to do, um, obviously, we'd love to get the whole amount. But we do bring, you know, these things do generate revenue. We charge five dollars a pair for these. We bring back on the average of sixty five hundred a year. They do pay for themselves. The, these brown boots have paid for themselves probably twenty times over at this you point. Expect I mean, would it ever make sense to have some kind of rolling, you know, where they get replaced? kind of on a schedule so that it doesn't just hit all at once? Because it seems like if you buy them all at once now, they're all going to fall apart at the same time down the road, which maybe you just can't help, but. Yeah, I, I, there's some, yeah, there's a, that's certainly an option. Um, we, we have, our inventory is in rough, rough shape. That's why I'm coming so to you. So it probably all place. needs pretty yeah, much Yeah, there's, replaced there's pretty now. much not any boot there. I mean, other than the, the one or two replacements we've bought the last few years, that's not in rough shape at this point. Um, and I have a question on the, considering rentals are coming from public skate opportunities mm -hmm. and um, as a personal consumer, I find that the, the sessions are very limited. Um, and is, just, is that due to staffing or are there this, opportunities this year, to increase? Yeah, this year, so it's a catch-22 with the ice rink. We want to provide a public service, but we're also obligated to bring in revenue. And the, uh, uh, two hours of private ice time in the afternoon when a public skate session would be held can bring in up to $500. Got it. Okay. 
we don't if we if we held a public skate session during that same time we may we may get 50 we may get 200 people and we will run skates to some of those people as well but we also have to bring in five to six people to staff that public ice that public session so it's a balance of you know we're walking this fine line and we've talked about this over and over the last few years those of you who've been who've been here are we a public service or are we a, an enterprise and so we're trying to walk that fine line this year we actually had a hard time finding ring staff and ring guards so we actually cut our our teaching staff as well so we actually cut down from two days of lessons down to one mm -hmm. we probably made more money renting that ice so on Tuesdays and Thursdays we typically offered skating lessons this year we just offered Thursdays for the two sessions this year um, because we couldn't find enough staff to do that it's similar to rink guards we had a very tough time trying to find enough rink guards all through the winter we probably yeah. couldn't have handled sure. the, the vacation when we during school vacations and when kids are out of school we always try to make sure we have a, at least a two-hour session available mm -hmm. we've been probably behind the number of staff we needed almost every session this winter. On and, and what's the kind of rate of private, um, you know, rental use? Where does that come from? Does it come from schools, uh, so, organizations? So our, our, largest, our largest tenant at the rink is Simsbury Youth Hockey. The second largest would be the high school um, and their teams. And then we get into, um, we have a, a number of weekly groups who rent an hour or two, men's drop-in groups or... Um, the mother Ducks hockey team, women's hockey team, they, they rent two or three hours a week as well. Um, so those, they're consistent from November right through early March. And um, the typical ice rink season is mid-March. We're actually going to close on the 13th this coming week. And so from the, no, from the open season of it, how often is the rink used or not being used? So uh, John Tebow's done a great job um, adding more morning programs. So we, so for instance, I think what your question is: the busiest time of the rink is two, on a weekday, is when school ends, two thirty till ten o'clock at night. On weekends, youth hockey starts up, and some of those parents who've been there in the morning it starts up at six in the <laughs> six in the morning potentially, and goes till ten o'clock at night between youth hockey and our. Skate, public skating and private rentals. Saturday evenings are pretty pretty uh, well attended for private rentals, or pretty well rented. Um, the morning sessions, so we've, we've done this year, or through the pandemic, we've actually been doing a Monday morning miles program where the rink opens up at eight o'clock, you can go out and skate you know, for an hour and a half just doing circles. Then at nine, let's say 10 o'clock, it opens up from 10 to 12 for a, a drop-in skate. So you'll have a number of people, some will be doing figure skating, some are just doing skating. Um, the numbers for those average between uh, the Monday morning miles, maybe five or six people, where the afternoon, where the, the public skate in the morning couldn't go anywhere from 20 to 50, uh, depending on the weather. Um, so we've been trying, you know, we're not just letting the ice, the ice sit there. We're, we're trying to find programming out there. We get a lot of Montessori groups. We get a lot of um, homeschool groups who rent during the morning hours. We get um, uh, some alternative school programs have been coming out this year. There's a number of schools from Win uh, Litchfield and Winstead who have been coming out um, and bringing their, it's almost like their gym class. So uh, that's who we rent to during the, during the weekdays. That's great. That's yeah. great. And I appreciate the initiative in the off season that yeah. you're trying to create, yeah, we've continue with the revenue. Yeah, we used to do, you know, we've done over the years, we've done movies in there, we've done concerts, we've had the senior picnic. Um, Senior picnic has been held in there for years, and you know it's a good location where you don't, you know, you know you're not going to get rained out for for a big event like that. Um, Public meetings. Pub, pub, yeah, we had the town Italian. meeting for Meadowood last year. Uh, the Farmington Valley Jewish Congregation has been renting the rink almost, I think, three year, two or three years now for for their services for big for big events of the you know the holidays. Um, they're going to be renting again from us tentatively for this uh, this fall, at this point. Um, but we've had we're hoping with the 50th anniversary again we're going to do some movies we're going to do some concerts. Again we're going to try the dog training in there. Um, we I'm hoping at some point we'll be able to do a cornhole league in there, um, oh, you know, stuff like that. We've, you know, we've even had people rent for dodgeball rent rent the rink for do, you know their own dodgeball events and things like that. So there's there's opportunities, um, you know it's, you know with staff with. Again, having another staff person come online to help coordinate some of that stuff, that's going to be a big help to get this thing going. Um, but we know we're trying to maximize the resources we do have. Are we, pa are we passed, uh, or maybe it's a question for Orlando. I'm sorry, I'm bit. So we did, we, we had the evaporate, we had the condenser, the evaporate, whatever that, what was yeah, the? So we, oh, go ahead. Yeah, the condenser was in place this past year, uh, and the chiller hopefully is going That's the next, the chiller's done. And then we had a control unit control for something unit also. See, I got a memory here, okay. okay. And then um, that's all done. Okay. And then what about the netting and the painting? The netting is in pretty good shape. The painting was done a year and a half ago. Okay, so what's the next big ask? For the rink? Yeah. I can't think of it. After the chiller replacement, we should hear this, Dave? We did the LED lighting. Tom, LED Tom's, uh, 
Tom's lighting program helped in us the, do the LED right. lighting in the rink, which is phenomenal in, in there. And the heater was done in the in the viewing room, right? Yeah. You'd be pretty, okay. Uh, yeah. All right. Was Not much left, Dave. <laughs> Yeah, the, 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 rink is in, the rink is in really good shape. I mean, they, oh, the, the rubber that. matting, I think, say is that the again. next ask. Mm -hmm. the, um, yeah. yeah. I, think, okay. I think the only plan, the only thing we have in the CNR plan is rink matting. And that's the, most of it's the original matting that's down I there. Don't, that's, that's, that's a safety sometime. issue, too. Yeah. 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 So that, that's, okay. that's a few years out. But they've, I mean, his crew does a phenomenal job upkeeping the rink. I mean, what we've gotten out of that since 1999, I mean, it, it's held up well. Um, the minute anything shows signs of wear or breaking, he, you know, his guy, him and his guys are usually on it. Um, and is there a, um, is there a, uh, uh, and I, I mean, I participate and yeah. contribute to the, to the Simsbury Youth Hockey Program um, without having any kids playing in hockey, seemingly, I don't know why, but... Um, that organization is pretty healthy and pretty active. And now, is is there a component of the Sims, Friends of Simsbury Farms and or a component of that organization, the youth hockey, that does special projects, if they will, that contribute towards rink improvement or experiential improvements yeah, on their own? Uh, that's, a good, that's a good question. Yeah, uh, Tom Cross, who, sure. who is uh, old, old coach, yeah, one of the, one of the, the high school heads coach. of hockey yeah. in Simsbury. He's on the Friends of Simsbury Farms. Um, the, the most recent ice rink project they did was they replaced the um, the two score controllers. Uh, scoreboard controllers mm -hmm. down there they're pretty pricey um the, the hockey goals. oh and the hockey yeah they and hockey goals yep mm -hmm. yeah, so it's good to hear that i just only said that, that there are, there's participation amongst residents in their own dial on own dollars directing it into the program and all just not the broad base so that's a good sense of that's another part yeah, of our community the, the, the that goes on been a, a great partner with us yeah. Yeah, they, they're really good and um john you know john uh, tebow the rink supervisor does a great job you know working with them on scheduling and you know, getting it right for so it works for both groups. So we're not having dead ice and. Well, it takes place across the board. Though I think that it's un, it doesn't go spoken and I'm off track. That you know, whether it's youth soccer, whether it's youth lacrosse, whether it's youth baseball, all those programs put money into these town facilities that we don't see and there are considerable, there are considerable cons, uh, 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 contributions that otherwise would be funded on a more broadly on a broad basis. I want to. I never. I had some uh, hockey ice questions. Sure. And again, well, yeah, we, we, so we looped can a, looped around. Well, first of all, the capital budget, um, the CNR, <clears throat> you have in 23-24 to upgrade the PA and video system, right? So that's just an improvement of what we have today. Yeah, yeah it's it's well, uh, the one actually the PA system we have down there is limited. We actually can't use the microphone hooked up to it. We have to we have a workaround right for it right now. So the original speakers that were installed for whatever reason the, the wiring's off yeah, now. The wiring's off. Yeah, no, there's some, a mouse ate the wiring probably somewhere in the ceiling or wherever. So it, it just that needs to be. Again, those speakers have been down there for 20 years. They just need to be replaced and rehooked up to the to the sound system in the guard shack. Okay. Um, That's more of an upgrade. Okay. Yeah. Well, it says video. Like, what? Are, what's the video? Just, anyway, just, just we have a big like, center. No, like, <laughs> okay. Okay. The other question I had was, um, as a hockey mom for many many years. Do we do skate sharpening at the farms? We, do. we charge seven dollars for a okay. rental, so you drop. Uh, it's actually a really popular program. We drop people can drop their skates off. You, know, you walk in today, drop them off today. You pick them up tomorrow. Because we used to have to go to Westminster yeah. if they were open yeah. or whatever. So I was for, for fifty years. Yeah. Been, okay. Do you have a good guy that does it though? <laughs> like all, all of our guys are good. Okay. Okay. Because I I know they're special people. Yeah. Our uh, so that's one of the jobs that our, our second shift person does okay. during okay. the week. That's that's his that's one of his responsibilities. We have a good system where he comes in, sees how many he has to skate, and then he or how many he has to sharpen, and he does them before the end of the night, and then the next day they're ready to go. Okay. Great. At one time we were doing about. 50 skates a week. That's dropped. Okay. Over years. Over okay. And then one more thing is if you're looking for hockey skates, I have a basement full and I'd be happy to donate <laughs> to, to the farms. We got a lot of people who want to. Unfortunately, for liability reasons, we cannot accept those skates, Wendy. Yeah, you're mm. on staff. I, uh, I, used to, I worked for you a lot. I know you, <laughs> you did. <laughs> little, little, little known fun fact Sean, Sean and I both used to work at the yeah, skating center uh, together. Yeah, oh, you did? I worked for Tom, yeah. <laughs> Gosh. We, get, we get the team back together. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. They're paying better now. <laughs> um, again, uh, moving on here. Thank you, Melissa. The, um, the, the, we're asking that the general fund contribution of the revenue, revenue fund be restored to fiscal year 21. That would be an increase of $31,715. Um, that offset, that's kind of what we've been working toward to offset the cost of the shared utilities, shared community use of the facilities, and um, staffing. Uh, this budget, again, it's, it's not, it's not a, 
uh, we're asking for the world budget. This is going to maintain our current services and allow us to do what we do for the community. Mm -hmm. also, uh, getting into our CNR and CIP projects and ARPA projects, um, last year I came to you and asked for $200,000 um, for the Simsbury Farms Playground. That was based on estimates we had received from meeting with vendors um, to replace that, that, pro that, that playground. Um, things have skyrocketed in the last year as we've kind of gotten, we've gotten more into it. Orlando and I met with four vendors this past fall and winter and prices are going up 30 to 35% across the board. Timelines are almost a year out at this point um, to get an install. If we order something, if we ordered something in April, we're not going to see it till probably uh, next April at that mm. point. It's just gotten so constrained. Um, we're hoping that um, you'll consider uh, $75,000 in funding out of the opera money to help us get that project complete. Um, and moving so that we can open that playground next year um, before it gets any worse. Again, it's a 28-year-old playground um, at this point, and we just can't get parts to uh, replace the existing equipment that's there. Go ahead. Sinsbury Farms Golf Course Base Prep. Um, I'll, I'll give you the high-level stuff, and then Brian's right here to, <laughs> to kind of fill in the gaps for me. But we have, when, when it rains, Sinsbury Farm the, the golf course, um, now we have a lot. It's, it's just a wet. It's a wet course to begin with. When we've had extreme weather the last few years, we're losing a lot of revenue um, because we can't let golf carts out, and then that affects who can play. We do have a lot of a, a large number of seniors who play daily, um, so you know it makes it more difficult for them to get on the course. But we we've kind of had an unfinished product pro project up there for a long time. They built car paths. They didn't extend them all the way all the way to the green or or through all the way through the wet areas wet, for whatever reason budget cuts or, or whatnot or time um, time and staffing at, the, at that point. But what we'd like to do is take those those paths that stop before the wettest areas in the course and extend them to a dry area of the course. Um, so that way, our, you know, we can keep the course open more. We can get that golf cart that golf cart revenue, um, and then reduce maintenance time following those wet events to fix ruts. Uh, basically, and Brian, we've got a couple of pictures that'll illustrate that. Um, so year one, we'd have our architect design, you know, due to the des design the, the paths in consultation with Brian. Um, we'd start excavating the, the, those lengths of, of the most important ones first. We'd start excavating, put some gravel down, um, and then next spring, we'd come back for more money to say, uh, to start paving that area where we prepped and then excavate the next area in line. It's a three to four year process. Brian, you want to add anything to that? No. No. Okay. And you can show this. To it all. So here's some examples of that where the cart path, the paved path, just stops, and you get either a washout, and people are driving through this. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Creates number, uh, just the number of hours he has to, that him and his crew have to do to repair that after the fact, um, and it just takes away aesthetically from the golf course as well. If you if you, you came out for your first time a couple of days after a rainstorm, you'd be like, what 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 is this? I mean, um, is that a safety issue? It seems like. No. Well, what happens, that's a good question, Amber. What's going to happen is you'll, you'll get people who drive through this and ruin it. And yeah, it's, it's slippery. You could get somebody slipping. But then you get, you get people who will, okay, I can see the washout here. I'm going to go off to the right, off the cart path here now. And then they start running out that area. So you're just making the problem, you're exacerbating the problem um, even more. Um, last year we had a number of extreme events. What was it, seven to ten days last year that we lost? Yeah. That we lost carts for either the whole day or most of the day. Um, and you know we we tried to he's, he'll he'll do his best. He, we've tried matting, we've tried some other things, we've tried signage, um, but again, when you put the signage up and try to keep people off of that, you're just creating a problem somewhere else. Yeah. Um, so, you know, we're not asking for tea to green cart paths, but at least tea to out of the uh, into the dry into the dry areas. Um, and he said Brian's been identifying the most important areas, and again, we'd work with, with an architect, which isn't that much uh, money, but it's. It's, it's the right way to do it and then move forward with um, starting to extend some of those paths. Yeah, 2018, the other wet year, past year, um, comparable to last year, but we were having golf carts getting stuck yeah. you know, on our 12th hole. It was uh, unbelievable. Yeah. Or the pro staff has to run out there and push people out. Yeah. So. And, it, and the plywood out there. We've, we've had some phenomenal years at the golf course the last two years. It's, it's, mm -hmm. been, it's been crazy up there. But that's, that, those revenue numbers are still reflecting seven to 10 days of, of lost cart revenue. Mm -hmm. um, we could, so we could be even doing, we could be doing even better. So, I mean, the, I, I mean, as a golfer, I kind of understand this, um, but the, the, so we've had a golf course for what, 50 years, yep. right? But the same problem, right? So the golf course has been, people are still playing golf, you know, with, um, once you put that cart path in, now we've got a 
cost to maintain that cart path, which is then an ongoing. So what is the, what's the, um, we lay that cart path. Let's say we extend, in that picture, we extend that cart path to the optimum place that alleviates the, the burden on the uh, other areas. What's that, what's that cost roughly in that, in that picture? Is it 10 grand? Oh, for, for just one, this one little spot yeah. here? I wouldn't say it's 10 grand. That's, yeah, that, I don't know. Okay, so let's just say it's, let's say it's five. So then, 20, 20 right, yards again, 50% wrong or right, right? So the, the, come on, Tom, you work with that all the time. Okay, so, and then when are we going to hit it again? Probably 15, 12 years from now? Okay, so the only reason why I ask that to a certain extent is that when we have these, because again, these are these are um, problems that are nice to have problems, right? For because we talk about the users. Now we talk. You know, the golf, I am a full supporter of the golf course. I believe it supports itself, to, to, by and large, for the most part. But um, if we could quantify that that five thousand spent in the next over. $5,000 investment over the next 10 years is equivalent to however much, and I'm pointing to Orlando, which is probably your team, what are we spending in man hours and product and whichever and lost revenue, whichever over that mm -hmm. same period of time, then is, the, is it like the skates where we're investing money to save money, really, versus people saying, oh, you're, pav you're, car you're paving the car pass? You don't need to pave car pass. That's another luxury for the golfers. So that to me is a way to look. We should be somewhat mm -hmm. trying to building these cases in the future. It's a little short on time now, but yeah. kind of think about that as you come back, I think. And that helps people who are non-golfers understand the return, especially our friends on the yeah. Board of Finance. Not that you're non-golfers. I'm, I'm saying you're not money. getting the, the dialogue. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 I appreciate Tom, Tom's comment about 12 to 15 years. Do you know when we've paid, when you, Dave's probably more familiar with it, when we last paved those pay up paths? I would say it's closer to 20 years. I'd say yes. Yeah, yeah. 20 to 25, because they get so, I mean, you're not driving trucks on them, you're driving little golf carts on them. Um, I, 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 what's that? The asphalt from 20 years ago? Yeah. I hate to say this was better than the asphalt. All right, well, that, yeah. that, then, that's a good point. <laughs> yeah. But the, the existing car. I was like my father, back in the old days, we had better asphalt. I, I just wanted to make the point. <laughs> we, we walked to school, too. Yeah, okay. I just want to make the point, the last time we did this was, was <laughs> Yeah, yeah, 20 yeah, to 25 I just think that that's the way to, I think that helps us visualize cost, return, return on cost, versus just, you know, that we, I've got guys out there, and gals possibly, out there doing this, and it's this, that. That's just, so to me, very amorphous when we're trying to figure out, okay, this is a dollar and a dollar, you know. I mean, it's not just an aesthetic improvement. It's, it's. We're investing for. Investing, yeah. right, and preventing future damage. Well, in the weather, every year, the. Climate has changed, and we've gotten right. more and more wetter, rain, so yeah. it's not going to get better. Yeah. And I, I, I did want to make sure we, we I, I don't know if I said it before, but it is an accessibility issue, too. We, right. You know, we, our course is heavily in the morning played by mm -hmm. seniors, and uh, we do want to keep it accessible to those mm -hmm. people who, who utilize that town resource. Mm -hmm. That's recipe for carts rented out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, you can go ahead. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, Town Forest Park dredging. This has been discussed internally for the last few years, um, but it's become more pro more kind of brought to the forefront over the last two years with the pandemic. Uh, a lot of people utilize that have grew up here utilizing that town resource for swimming and took swimming and at one uh, took swimming lessons there at one time. Mm -hmm. um, up until nineteen up until the year two thousand, I think the town used to lifeguard that that mm -hmm. facility. The Y YMCA ran a camp um, and taught swimming lessons and had their their kids swim time um, up until probably 2005, 2006 over there. Um, but that that pond hasn't been dredged in Orlando 20 years? It hasn't been done in quite a, quite a, quite a few years. So uh, at this point, the depth is, is compromised. Um, it is downstream from uh, the brook that runs into it or the stream that runs into it. And uh, so a number of silt deposits. Uh, Jerry Toner, uh, who was the director here previously, had gotten a quote um, a few years ago, and, and they actually mapped out where the the silt is lying and piling up and there's a number of limbs and leaves in there and it's, it's just compromising the integrity of that pond. Um, it would, you know, our, our estimate um, in looking at the previous estimate and where things are now, we're estimating about $50,000 to dredge that pond out. Um, it would improve the pond's environment, the health of the pond. Um, I, it would satisfy, it would checks off one of the boxes in the parks, recommendations in the parks and open space master plan. It would make it, um, 
an aesthetically more pleasing resource. We don't intend to lifeguard it. It would be at a swim at your own risk if somebody wanted to um, swim in there. Um, we, do, we do plan on cleaning up the beach a little bit. Orlando's been working on that um, the last few years to mow it down, rake the beach regularly to keep the weeds, try to keep the weeds down. Um, so if we dredge that, we would, you know, we would spend some resources on, or staff resources to keep that area looking good. And we have, we're going to pull the playground equipment out of there. We'd like to add um, some picnic tables and some grills eventually over there um, and, you know, enhance that resource that we already have. So, oh, I was going to say, so I'm glad to see that it was in the open space master plan. I remember, talk, I think Susan Messina was talking yeah. about, um, and also the potential to open it back up like health-wise to residents and life with lifeguard or not. The, yeah, the, the health district used to regularly test that um, throughout the summer and you know, in consultation with Orlando. Yeah, we used to do, do testing weekly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, used to run to a camp there, and uh, we used to actually clean it on. So would, 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 be t would we be doing testing if we dredge it so that we know that the levels are safe if people were going to – we, we could do that during the, during the summer season, yeah. Okay, and then the other thing you just mentioned, which is not up there, um, replacing the old playground equipment that's there with picnic tables, things like that. Is that something that you would ask included in the we, ARPA we would, funding? We would, we could, I guess we could do it that way. We do have, we, I would kind of pull that under the, um, the playground funding we've been getting. Okay. We're not talking thousands and thousands of dollars. Yeah. I mean, pulling out, we do that on our own. Picnic tables, $1,000 a piece maybe. Um, and some grills, you know, four or five hundred. I just, yeah, I was looking at it more specifically to town forest, but you, you, you would look at them as different items. But I'm just saying, you know, the funding, the grant funding that we're getting, we're going to use some of it to dredge the pond, and it potentially could attract more people there. Do we want to throw in a little more? We're not discussing that now, but maybe we throw in a little more to make it more of a destination for people to go hang out. I mean, that, our, our end goal is to make it more of a destination. Yeah. I think that's what we want to do. We want to make it. We're not doing this just for the sake of, you know, just yeah. for the sake no, of it's, it's doing great, it. No, it's a great yeah. spot. How, how long does the dredging, would you anticipate the dredging would last until we have to spend another 50? It could be 15. It could be less. Oh. You know, it's going to depend on weather, weather conditions, too. Um, you know, if you get heavy, heavy snow or, or heavy snow or flooding and things wash into that pond, and then you got to take them out eventually. So is, is it accurate then? I mean, I did swim there as a kid, yeah. right? And so, yeah. so it, it, in the... When there was a lifeguard, and probably then there wasn't, but there was it actively dredged back then, or was it just did we have different weather oh, patterns oh, and yeah. there was nature different, so we didn't dredge it that much? Right, Chris, Chris, we used to drain it ourselves in house mm -hmm. and go in there with our yard crate and do our own. Just pull it back, right? yeah, yeah. But it wasn't ever a complete dredging, it was just an in house routine mm -hmm. yearly maintenance that we used to do. Because the YMCA, they had 200 kids there. Sure, you know, I did that camp, yeah. Summer. So that was done in-house, but it was never a complete dredging. There's really two ponds there. You got the holding pond and you got the actual swimming pond. Yeah. So you really both kind of work together, uh, so they both would need to be dredged. So uh, with the dredging, if once that's done, will maintenance be put in place to hopefully increase yeah, I mean, that's kind of what he was just, what, yeah, we, we have the ability to lower the level and then he can get a, some equipment in there to pull some stuff. Pull some Wait, stuff. Which two ponds are you talking about? There's the well, right behind it, the main swimming pond next to it is a little, little, a little small little pond next to it. It's they're kind of at one, they're, they're kind of separated. Uh, they're in the same area, but there's a little wall in between the two, a little stone wall, as you can see over there. But, hmm. You, you can't really, yeah, you can't really notice it. They're kind of back to just back. just two days ago. Yeah, okay, they're, back, they're back to back, uh, Chris. Okay. So, so, so then that bridge there, the walking path, the bridge that goes over, how? And now we're going to get to that bridge, I bet, at some point. The bridge and that dam. Where does that fall? Who's? The, the, the valves for that dam were replaced about 10 years ago. Okay. They're fully reshaped. The dam is in good shape. The bridge was... Uh, repaired, painted about two or three years ago. Yeah. Uh, so th those are those structures are in fairly good shape. Okay, so there's not a there's not a compounding event that occurs. We dredge this out mm -hmm. and create I don't know more volume, and then the, the, then there's a compound effect that where the dam and the bridge are no longer adequate, and then they have to be done at whichever. They're in really good shape. It okay. Great flow at, at that at that pond, so it keeps the water a lot cleaner. Uh, but uh, I don't I don't foresee that in the near future. And then the, the, the two pavilions that are there, there's sort of the upper pavilion and then the smaller pavilion. The upper one was removed yeah. about uh, 10 years ago, yep. so we only had the lower pavilion. So the lower, so the lower one replaced the upper one, correct. Correct. but the, the pad is still there. The pad top, is still right? there, yeah, okay. correct. But there are grills up top yeah, there? Are the, the grill, there's, so nothing, there's not infrastructure left up there? Not on the top. Okay. Can we give them a tour? 
<laughs> I was just walking through it yesterday, two days ago, the snowstorm. So anyways, but I mean, all I can see is that again, because we do this, then there's going to be another ancillary ask down the road at some point, other, other service improvement there. That's all. Yeah. yeah, when you have a facility like that, unfortunately, you don't have some, some type of maintenance going forward, but you know, doing routine maintenance should offset some of that, that going forward. The, um, the level of, you know, with Stratton Brook is at the similar mm -hmm. sort of destination. You know, what do you see there in numbers, and does that give you an idea of what you would see as demand for Town Forest if it's revamped with picnic tables in a similar setting? I mean, it's hard to say because we don't keep, we don't track the numbers at Stratton Forest, mm -hmm. being being that it's a state park. We do get a lot of calls for people who have questions about it. I can tell you, I can tell you that because they just assume it's us. Um, we have seen a, a, a huge uptick in the in the amount of requests by school groups, scout groups, uh, religious groups. Um, I've already taken three this year for graduation parties at the pavilion at Town Forest. Um, so there's, it, it, there's been a, a lot more interest in people utilizing the town resources, getting outdoors, having outdoor events. Um, Anecdotally, it's we're we're also doing mountain biking classes over there as well. That's where we're gonna. That's, we're doing most of our classes. Um, so it's a you know should the weather you know should it be bad weather they can get under the pavilion for a few minutes. That when I when I on my trips over there I don't know about Orlando it's that pavilion is usually being used by somebody in the afternoon. Um, whether it's people coming off coming out of the trail and sitting down and having lunch or taking a rest or walking their dog or whatever it's it's a heavily used it's a really nice spot if you've ever been there it's right by the babbling brook and you know I go over there to, to get my you know when I want to get away and get a quiet lunch <laughs> it's once in a while so it's a good spot so not to be that guy that you have about 20 parks and rec fund items right to go through yeah if we take this much time for each one we're going to be here till two <coughs> so Uh, this is the Sims. This is, I, I apologize for the tough pictures. It's just the way the light is, the lighting is here and, and the weather when we when we took the pictures. But this is the waiting pool at Simsbury Farms. The, the last few years, the plaster has been deteriorating. So those white areas you're seeing are areas where we've already fixed plaster, fixed plaster. But the, the remaining is you know we and again we've put about five thousand dollars into it already. Um, in just a couple of small areas on the ramp leading down and in the area by the drain there um, by this yeah. Um, so it, we we're asking for 30,000 in funding to basically replace all of the plaster. Um, it's a heavily used part of the pool. And um, again, we're, we're throwing money out, good money after bad if we don't do it, don't do it right. This is the annual ask for the playground, uh, playground improvements. Typically, we've been, we've been asking for 25,000. Um, we, are, we are asking for 30 based on the, the information I gave you before about supplies and, and uh, increases in cost of these, uh, these pieces of equipment. Can you just remind me, for some reason, I don't remember, I thought we like just didn't do West Mountain Park, but I, I saw it in here that we did it, so. No, so. <laughs> we, I know we talked about yeah. not doing it. No, 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 we are, that West Mountain's the, the highest priority one of all of the them. The one off of. Um, West Mountain Road? Yeah. Yeah, that, we, we've actually got two, we're kind of down to two designs on that. Um, and again, it's, it's been a slow process with staffing levels, co you know, COVID, dealing with the problem of the day, and then some some uh, issues. I've I've been out of work for a little bit too, but we're still looking to get that program that playground replaced this summer, probably later summer now. Um, but that's the first one. That'll be a complete tear out and and, and rebuild there, um, and then we'd be looking at Terrafield Park, um, and then getting around to the the one next to the pool at Memorial, and then. Uh, we tog and then metal pond after that. Yeah, that was my memory. I probably yeah. it was my first budget we, year. We Did I? Yeah. Put it back. Okay, that might have been mm -hmm. it. Yeah, and we, you know, we also have you know ongoing maintenance issues at Rotary Park too. So some of that money, some of this playground money is being used to replace things there as well. So just a question with the costs going up, and I will get to. I know we're going to talk about this stuff again, but the costs are going up, just like the farms playground. You know, is seventy five thousand dollars more. Are these projects that are? are are they going to continue to grow up? So if we wait four years, then it's going to be like four times as much. Uh, yeah, or is it better to put them on hold? Like we yeah, I mean, I'd like to think that you know, we, I, I'm hopefully I'm not the only one thinking that things will get better eventually, and think the supply lines will open up and we'll return more to a normal economic so does, uh, situation. Yeah, but does that mean then do you hold off on some of these projects rather than some of, some of them cannot be hold off on? There's okay. just the period in that that far. Yeah. If okay. if we if we're going ahead with some of the work planned at Terra, at Terrafil, it makes sense to do this oh, all yeah, at the same yeah, time if yeah. we get if we move along. So, I agree. yeah, but Wendy has a good point. 
what if you just so there's we have the you know the the boogie we, everything that's always boogeyman around us is a, you know we always with the what if and we, we know what's going to happen that's always the excuse to do something and the leverage so we talk park for example not just, i'm not picking out we talk but if it's a point where that's they're unsafe and that's the le the lever is always it's unsafe so therefore you must do this that's what we always hear um, what if you just ripped it out entirely and waited the four years? So we, we lose the service, yeah. which is unfortunate for those folks. But it's, again, to Sean's point, Terrafield is only four miles from the library. You know, so you know, we, there's that we have this thing. Well, so unfortunately, you may have to go someplace else. Yeah. We offer these services elsewhere, and it's unfortunate they're not near. So I, I, I think that's something we should consider seriously. Is that yeah, no, versus a, it, getting on a schedule? Yeah. I know once we pull them out, then the fear. Somebody will tell me. Well, then the fear is you pull it out. We're never going to revisit it. Yeah. No, it's, it's a, always somebody's always going to give me the the, the the fear, but I, we may need to be thinking yeah. that way. I, I mean, it's a good point, and that's why we, for, for using WeTog as the example, that's why that one's going to be at the end because we're not that at that point where it's not safe yet. Mm -hmm. um, I, mean, and, I think it's also a balance between wanting people. I mean, people have utilized outdoor spaces because of the pandemic, so you would just have to balance if the financial, you know, the cost benefit yeah. of that. I mean, it's not just an inconvenience. I mean, it's also it seems counterintuitive that you are, you know, taking away playgrounds when people have used them so much because they needed to be outside, and we don't know that that could happen again. I agree, but we—it's not as if we're taking away. We have a playground for that person or that family to go to. We're not—we're not just closing the library and only had one library, not closing the ice rink and only had one ice rink. So I, I think it comes down to at the end when we look at the whole schedule. I think we have a prioritization, to right? Do, right? Mm -hmm. and right. We all decide individually where do the playgrounds rank? Do they rank one or do they rank mm -hmm. after the cybersecurity right. audit? And again, you know, the, the CNR breakdown. You know, when we get to it, and you know, town staff, I think he's done a great job of presenting it. That's how we make our prioritization decisions. Right. So, but this is good information on why you know why we're looking at it. It's mm -hmm. a it's a commitment to our infrastructure, much like sidewalks, much like roads. This is a community service that we provide. Go ahead. Uh, this is the golf course <coughs> clubhouse repair and, and replacements. Last year we did 35,000, and that's basically going toward um, the fire exit doors that need to be installed, the pathway with that. Uh, we've done some interior uh, door work as well. Um, this, this next request goes, gets more into the HVAC systems, the restrooms, the carpeting. Um, so hopefully you'll support that commitment that, that was made last year. Go ahead, Melissa. There's a couple of pictures that, is, that again, restrooms and the doors that, that are, are drafty, the hardware is breaking on them, they, they don't close evenly. Um, go ahead. And this is, the, this is the roof of the golf clubhouse. A couple of pictures here to illustrate that the shingles have, are, are off. They're falling off, the, off that building regularly as the wind blows. Um, I, I know during Maria's presentation, there was some question about the cost of this roof. It was based on, an, on a quote we just got in February, mid-February, January? Uh, February, late fall. Yeah. Um, by a, by a local contractor for that roof. Um, there's a number of different peaks. It's not, it's not your typical residential roof. There's a number of peaks yep. and valleys all over that roof. It's not you know, just like a, you know, a regular colonial. I mean, it's up and down. Yeah, no, the square footage makes it. Yeah, so it's, so it's, 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 it's the building's bigger than you think it, than yeah, most people think it is. That's what it was. I was like, is it a 3,000 square foot roof? It's yeah. like, mm, yeah. mm -hmm. so they're golden shingles. But yeah. you know, <laughs> <laughs> Trust me, I had to get my, 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 my home roof replaced, and I'm not, when I saw that number, too, I'm yeah, like, yeah, they're kidding me. Lord. <laughs> so, and again, it's, there's nothing, nothing's getting, nothing's gotten cheaper the last couple of years. Everything's only gotten more expensive. So, uh, but again, this is getting to the point where we can't put it off any longer. We'll start seeing water damage um, in the in the interior of the building if we put it off. Uh, go ahead, Melissa. Uh, this is the backstop at Weetog Park. Uh, this has been in the, in the plan for a few years now. Um, and again, it's if you've ever played softball on that field or driven by when a softball is almost at your car, you, you kind of know what we're talking. Why we're making the ask here? It's uh, it was installed many many years ago when fence fence heights, you know, weren't really certified. I guess there's no there's no um, no way to catch fall balls as they come back. Uh, so we get a lot of balls that go into traffic there, and, and people who are watching the watching the game from behind the fence. So we'd like to replace that. Can I ask a question on the We Talk Park because yeah. I see yes. that there's a Terrafil Park ask uh, either next year or the year out. For this, for the Terrafil back softball field backstop. Uh, is yeah, there one? Sure yeah. Pardon me. Next, yeah. next year. So, I think it's next year or year. Like, is there a benefit to doing both together so that they're equal footing? 
I mean, it's the same issue at both parks. Cost-wise, there could be a benefit. Uh, materials are extremely expensive right oh, now. True. They, they might go down. Oh, right. Year. So we could maybe push. We, we don't. Uh, we don't know. Yeah. We, to see like to see consider like to holding off on like the playgrounds do, or mm -hmm. and to do together even this year next year whatever. Okay. go ahead Melissa again uh, park entrance signs I believe we're going to be able to take a year this, on the good on the good side taking a year off the park entrance sign total total amount of years I think it was a five year ask before I think we've got it down to three and a half four now um, this this summer and fall this summer we'll hopefully have half of the signs that we've promised you out. Um, and then the irrigation system at the Little League at the Little League fields. Last year, you approved the, the ball field, the big ball field where the high school plays um, and American Legion plays. This year, this would be uh, some of the lower Little League fields, um, part of this system-wide or town-wide uh, irrigation system work that we planned. Go ahead, Melissa. Um, this is the golf dump, the golf the the one over-the-road vehicle the golf course has. It's their dump truck. They use it to. Get materials off site, move things around on site. It's a 2006 with 166,000 miles. It's a uh, standard transmission, which is not, not great. We've replaced that clutch three or four times, I think. Right, Brian? <laughs> At least two. At least two. So, uh, and this is a picture of it following this. Um, this project would be funded through the golf uh, equipment surcharge account, so it's not costing the taxpayers any money. We have the money now to do this. We just would like your blessing for that. Um, go ahead. And then same situation out of the golf equipment fund. This is a Toro turf sprayer. Uh, it's a pretty complicated piece of equipment, and I, I tried to show show you that in the back. And there's a lot of uh, it, it's imperative that this pro, that this piece of equipment works. Um, you know, it's not uh, oh this is okay type of thing. It has to be just right. You know, calibrated just right. Um, it's getting harder and harder to do that. And um, that picture in the middle shows you you know the the equipment we have now. You can kind of see the striping there see the, the darker greens and the lighter greens um, that should be all one color it shouldn't be striped like that and um, again this is my, this is funding that uh, again it's not costing the taxpayers anything it's out of the, the golf fees mm -hmm. <clears throat> go ahead Melissa and then our C our large CIP project the Simsbury Farms golf course irrigation system uh, we had the we had the, con the, the consulting engineer look it over at 2018 it was determined that the system you know is at the end of its useful life um, that was a, that was in 2018 we've carried this through the plan for a few years um, as we've carried it the the cost is going the cost has increased um, and now uh, we became aware the last I'd say the last two years we became aware that the or as the Oracle Farms <coughs> retention pond dam that basically is the you know holds the water and that we use for our irrigation system is compromised. It's not up to the, the current DEP specifications. And um, since we're since we have to replace the spillway or doing work in the spillway, we have to we have to bring the dam up to code. Um, so we had originally. Do you want to get into that? Okay. So uh, you know we've we pegged this project with the dam work at two two and a half or two million five hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. The engineering department, as they've been going through working with the with the consultants on the on the dam work, um, and the time and when we need to get it done, it looks like it's going to be more than that. The, the dam work is is increasing. We've we're pre I think we're pretty good on the irrigation cost um, of around 2.2, 2.3, but the irrigation, but the uh, dam work is becoming more due to the compli complicated nature of the f the spillway that needs to be installed. When the work has to be done, they have to put what's called a coffer dam into the pond, which, which allows us to use the irrigation system during the construction. Um, I know Tom, Tom as, uh, in his new role, is, work, is, is just diving into this and, and uh, becoming familiar with the project and looking for a way that this, if this work could be done in the off season, um, that cost stays closer to, to where we have it up there. If it has to be done in season, because of that coffer dam and, and the complicated work, then it needs to go, it's going to need to go up. And, uh, we've talked about the capital reserve fund for that. So, so. what number are we being asked to approve then? <clears throat> you know, it, what's what's tough, right, is that at this point in time, this is still the best estimate that we have. Um, and again, Tom, you know, Tom is just taking over. We're just getting this, you know, new information. Um, you know, potentially if we needed, you know, again, it's it's hard it's hard to say. You know, I think we saw one estimate of maybe needing maybe a hundred thousand. One hundred and seventy-five to two hundred. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah. But we're trying to figure out if that's accurate, if, again, if we can do some construction in the off season. So we're trying to look at options. This is all, again, very, very new information. So, that's again, this is sort of like the, the best, most accurate estimate we do currently have. And then we're just trying to work through some of that, yeah. um, the yeah. other information. And that's less than a 10% contingency. So you're not talking about a million dollars. No, okay. no, no. I mean, our, our preference from, from myself and Brian would be to have this done in the off season. That, that's, it's less impactful on the golf cart, on the, on the golf course. It certainly, from an uh, aesthetic point, standpoint, we'd rather have it done when most people aren't there and, 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 sound, and, and uh, the sound of the construction work, that kind Except of thing. Except if it fails mid-season and then you've got a bigger problem, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so what is considered what's considered off season? Uh no basically November to March. What, is it is there difficulty with it being with the weather doing it then? Or? So so we shut well that's that's the that's why and again I'm not I don't I'm not an engineer and I didn't stay at a holiday inn last night so I don't want to give you the wrong information. <laughs> the um just what the what the person in the engineering department told me most recently is that consulting firm feels this work needs to be done during the construction season, it's much more difficult for them to do this work. They don't do this type of work in the off season. We, we kind of feel differently on that, right? Well, and, and, and again, we're looking at options and it may be more difficult to construct it during the winter, but if it's gonna save us hundreds of thousands of dollars on the coffer dam, which adds no final value to the product. It, it's not like when you're, you know, that's something that's in, it, it's temporary and then it's taken out, it could cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the, the benefit we kind of have is we're exploring that option and then in-house, we have Kevin Clemens, who spent 26 years at Simscroft, so we have expertise on that, and we have no problem pushing back on the consultant saying, is there a better way? And it may be that it's more complicated to do it during the winter, mm -hmm. but if it saves us significant money, it's, it's right. worth that, right. and especially being again, our, our restraints are, we need to make sure the golf course um, stays watered, we don't want to lose the turf, but beyond that, it's making a safe product. Mm -hmm. So uh, is, oh, sorry. Yeah. is the, the two, five, five, the, the number, that's the dam and the irrigation system. Okay, that's at what this I wanted point. To, yeah. to, to say. And and when you're talking about doing it off season, this the whole project. We're just as a whole, the dam and the, the, the irrigation system would probably be done separately. Okay, that that's probably has to be done during construction season. But what we would do is shut. We would do that like two holes at a time, and shut down two holes. And then we move on to the next two holes. And for that need, for that period of work. For that yeah. Okay. Yeah. But it's not one of the dams. Dam dams that were pulled out. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just that's a Chris from another um, that was pulled out for ARPA or anything. It's embedded in this cost. Yeah, yes. that yeah, this is different okay. than the, the basal dam. On there. Yeah, and Jeff did briefly speak to um, this particular dam in this presentation in December. So if folks want a little more information on that, you could go back and, and review okay, this. Yeah, one. okay. That's yeah. A, they're all they're all meshed up together. Now Good this is things. like this is an example. The irrigation system is an example of the one of Dave and Jerry's, you know, end of days leverage uh, excuses of why we had to do this, you know. So if it fails. Um, the, if we fund, realistic, if we fund it for next year, then really when do you get a contract signed and then when do you get, I mean, in, in real, with, with considering labor and considering, uh, I, I imagine competing projects with the local contractors, like really when does this happen? So I'll, I'll take it, I'll, I'll take the first shot at it. So we're, we're hoping to do design work this, this spring on it. And then we'd have that would basically put together our bid spec, bid specs, and all that, that kind of stuff. The the number of companies that do this type of work are limited, and they do it regionally. So like you know maybe if it's somebody in Connecticut, they're doing projects up and down the East Coast for this type of thing. So we also have to fit into calendars. So our hope would be it would be within two years of getting the design work done. Um, yeah. So then you're so it's not going to be it's not going to be a fall 2022 project. It's right. going to so ideally it's going to be. Uh, ideally, in a perfect world, we'd get it done in 23. It could be 20. It could be 24. But that's the importance of of getting this funding done, so that it's on the calendar and we can go. We can move ahead with that. And then you. And then you are. Are you? And I have to tell you. Are you locking in the price of whatever the agreed contract is, and it's regardless of what happens to material costs at that yeah. point? Uh, How does this stuff work? I don't know. Yeah, that's a good question. I, this is this is the largest project I've ever been involved with. So, so we, oh, otherwise we're going to be coming back to our friends. Finance board say, well, we have a supplemental because, and not, I guess it's not the I'm just trying to understand how the yeah. process works. I mean, we'll use the best, you know, we use the best information we have at that time to set it up and, and, um, you know, complicate it further. When are we going to bond for it? Yeah. We wouldn't, if we built it in 23, we're going to bond for it then or in 24. Yes, sir. We built it in 23. We bond every other year. So depending on the 
completion of the work of the status, I bond when we need the cash. It would be either fiscal year 23 or fiscal year 25. So that'll matter for our tax schedule yeah. mm -hmm. in terms of how close are we getting to that eight and how close are we getting back down to seven? How soon are we getting back down to seven? Okay. We don't need to deal with that now. We'll just keep that in the back of our head for a while. Mm -hmm. Have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and there's, another, there's another golf course in town considering the irrigation project. It may be that if it is a if there if there is something about where you you contract with an organization that comes in and is moving along, you know, geographically and doing projects. Have a conversation. Is there is there, is there a savings there as well? Is there a partnership savings there? As well? I don't know how you can coordinate that when it's considering it's public funding. But however, yeah. have that conversation. And this is just a picture of the picture of the dam. You can actually see the how, how big it actually is. The the pump house is on the far left. Is that building in the middle? And then going to the right. I mean, this is it's probably the start of the dam. Me too. Mm -hmm. This is. <laughs> Um, and then this is the sp <laughs> this is probably the most concerning part right now for us is this 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 stand pipe. Um, it's basically the overflow for the pond. It's a steel pipe. Um, how how tall is it, Brian? You would say, twelve feet. Yeah, probably about that. Twelve feet. Um, and it's basically it's basically deter <laughs> it's deteriorating and kind of starting to fold in on itself. And there's holes in the you can actually see that spring leak in the side of it over there, on the right. Um, if this fails, our pond drains. And th so this is one of the, it, this is, was the impetus to get that dam, you know, what started the whole there's dam. The there's a leverage, it fails, <laughs> so, it drains. Where's it uh, go? What's that? Where's it go? It goes down toward, uh, uh, into Hop Brook, yeah. which is behind, you know, then it goes behind the high school. Yes. So there's wetlands behind that. Then, oh, which, cool. so I won't do any damage, but yeah. it is important. Not to your, not, not to where you live. <laughs> but, <laughs> nobody lives back, nobody lives back there, it's a floodplain. So, um, but yeah, we would lose, you know, everything on the golf course basically drains down to, this is the lowest spot on the golf course. And um, if we lose the standpipe, we lose the ability to irrigate the golf course. Uh, yeah, if it were to completely, what's that? This was from the fall, yeah. yeah. Uh, so yeah, if it were to completely fail, we, we would, wouldn't be able to irrigate. If it's a partial fail, you know, we're playing with fire, so. Uh, project near to dear in my heart, the, tickle, the Terrafield pickleball courts. This is a renovation of the existing two tennis courts that are over, over there that were built many, many years ago. They were, they were an asphalt base. Um, it's not the best surface for that playing for that area due to the water table. Uh, Post-tension concrete is, uh, would be the ideal surface there. It, it will withstand the freeze-thaw freeze -thaw cycle and we'll get many years out of it. Um, it's the same kind of courts that were built at the high school uh, a few years ago. I have a question on that. Yes. Um, I'm a little naive with this pickleball. So I see people playing it on tennis courts. Mm -hmm. If you build a pickleball court, is it specific to pickleball or can other sports so, be played on so it? So for instance, Simsbury, uh, Simsbury Farms and Henry James um, are both lined for tennis and two of the courts, are, Henry James is lined for pickleball and tennis. Uh, Simsbury Farms, we have two, we added two lines of pick, two lines of pickle lines, semi-pickle lines last fall. Um, so. You can you can play it. What we would hope to do at Terrafil uh, is take that the, the footprint of those two existing tennis courts right there mm -hmm. and turn it into the same size. We can fit six pickleball courts. Mm. So um, it can also be used for tennis. We would well. not line it for tennis. It would be because you with six pickleball courts, the the, the you'd have different net configurations. It's, confusing. it's, gotcha. it's a smaller the players will conf yeah. it's a <laughs> it's a smaller court. Um, so we could fit six of those over there just lined for pickleball. Whereas if we did it on this. The most common configuration, if you have two tennis courts, would be two pickleball. Some do where you do, uh, say, on the, the top half of the of the tennis courts, you do one court and then one on the other. It gets way, there's a lot more confusing lines at that point. It's not ideal. Some communities do it, okay. but um, we would like to just kind of center pickleball at that location. Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, I was going to add to. Would anybody miss the tennis courts there? No. No, those courts ha those courts haven't really been no, no. playable for tennis due to the number of cracks in it. Yeah, okay. The years a few years ago, we just we, we repainted the surface and just lined it for pickleball, and there wasn't any complaints about yeah. it. Okay, is there room there though? Just let's just say we could pin a tennis court there. Is there not not there? there's no that's no not on those courts yeah. like anywhere in the park. I mean no, okay, not so not the not, not tennis there. What we were we're thinking of moving where that where you see that um, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but where that sandy area is to yeah. the right of the tennis court, that's where the existing playground is now. We we're considering uh, to the left of the tennis court. You see the pavilion. Yeah. That pavilion's footprint may change. You know, if we re, if we do fund the the renovation or take down of that pavilion and, and put a new one there, a little bit smaller, and then move the move the playground area by the into that area between the pavilion and the tennis and the pickleball court. Mm -hmm. That would be 
Um, the ideal, I think, for Orlando and I, I think that's what we'd like to do there. What is the benefit of moving all of that? It, it's kind of, where it is now is it's kind of tucked in the back, and there's, it's, it's a lot of, yeah. um, a little closer to the river, right where it is. We'd like to move it where it's more visible, more closer to the parking area, mm -hmm. um, rather than just the turnaround there. But um, can you have somebody go down there and get that burnt portalette out of there? I thought it was. <laughs> the skids are still there. The remnants are still there. Are you the sure? Cause the, that, well, have you been down there recently? Because the park's been locked since November, t t December. <laughs> I was there t t two weeks ago, a week ago. Two days ago, it's there. There's oh, nothing did locked. Did you open it? Yeah. Somebody might have broke, cut the lock. It's supposed to be locked this time. No, of year. there's not. There's no, oh, no, there's oh. no lock down there. What is yeah. it? No, the company was supposed to come, come pick up. They, they, were, they had to wait for their insurance company to come out and take a picture. Well, of it. I don't know. It looks like either maybe now it's now a burned couch, but there's some remnants of something. Look at the skids of a. No, it's probably, and that's it's what it is. We, I apologize. It just for adds that. to the. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. But I think one of the good things about on that, it's right. If I think if we did, yes, you'd have the pickleballers from West Simsbury complain they've got to drive to Terrafil. But if, if you did sort of condense the pickleball in one, all, all in one area, you would yeah, increase. Yeah, it makes it a destination. It, it, it would be a destination, and you'd increase the level of activity there, mm -hmm. and you'd have, mm -hmm. you'd have less of the other stuff that occurs down there occurring. Mm -hmm. Because right now it's, it's, it's an opportunity I, I, for a free for all. <laughs> Marie and I have been saying that for three, yeah. for three so, years. <laughs> and I said, so you, when you put activity and mm -hmm. energy there, right. it takes away from other activities mm -hmm. occurring yeah. down there. Yeah. Pick, Pickleball is a very social game. I mean, these people, I mean, jo right. if Joan were here, she'd be the first one to tell you. She goes to Bloomfield. <laughs> she goes to Windsor. Mm -hmm. She goes all over the place to play. And it's people from all the communities right. go to these so places. So I know about yeah. we would be one of those yes. places. And so people I know from about Sinsbury the idea like of repurposing multiple, but if you just do it all one, and you're just shifting the capacity around. You're not necessarily taking away capacity. Yeah. So if you create the mentality that this is our, this is our uh, international pickleball, pickleball mm -hmm. uh, center, yeah. then, you, then you have people come. And, and, and as a footnote, I, I did mention that Henry James has pickleball lines. Those pickleball players are not allowed to be on the Henry James courts during school hours. So uh, typically, these older people right. like to the, yeah. the older people like to play in the morning. They can't get on. They can't get on those courts yeah. till two thirty. Mm -hmm. Till two thirty at best. If there's intramural sports, sports that particular day, they can't be on them at all. I mean, it seems like it would increase our capacity quite a bit to have six additional. Yeah. yeah oh yeah. Well, well without without a doubt. Yeah. And it's it's a gr it's a growing sport. It's only going to get right. bigger. But I, I think again, it benefit. It, it gets people to Terrafield. It gets people to this park. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, maybe they play pickleball yeah. in the morning and they go up to Marcos or Mike, to, to the, the library. Library bike and stop there. Yeah. So um, yeah. I was going to say a couple Great. things. You know. I just wanted to mention when we get to cap more capital items about Terrafield Park, obviously, and ARPA funding, there's a lot of opportunities there that we can all talk about, especially including the bike, bike path. Um, one other thing I did want to bring up, you know, what we have currently in the CNR for Terrafield Park, there's also um, John Hampton's presented um, p bonding opportunities that we could apply for through, I'm not sure what the program is, but if, if you think of other things, hardware, physical things that might be good at Terrafield Park, picnic tables or, you know, whatever that we may not be funding, if we could keep starting listing those, we could apply for those through a bonding effort through the state and potentially get more stuff down there. So I'm just putting that out there to kind of maybe get a wish list together. If we can't fund it ourselves, we can maybe get some state funding because that's a project that he's looking into. A bond or a grant? It's a there's a there's a bond not oh. for this from the state that he was oh, okay. looking with the lieutenant governor. So I don't know the name of the program, but it was just mm -hmm. sent to us. I have the bond thing that I was going to forward on to you guys to see if there's opportunities. Mm -hmm. Uh, home stretch here. Sorry for everybody. <laughs> Take off time. Can you? Why don't you sit down? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, it's come fine. On. I, I appreciate it. I'll take you off. Take you off <laughs> You're supposed to be about sit at the desk. activity. <laughs> you can you can just fast forward. For us. Go on. For those of you that kind of message that send to the youth of America, you know. Yeah. So sit down. I feel like what's that from? Sit. Down. <laughs> All right. Um, so this is the, the, the long spoken about uh, rest, public yeah. restroom project at, at the Meadows. Yeah. Yeah. So we're asking for 350,000. Again, this would either go toward a permanent restroom facility or go toward uh, a match for the fundraising efforts that this, at the Performing Arts Center board is doing, or Simsbury Meadows is trying to do. Um, and we would put that $350,000 toward that, toward that project to ensure that there'd be three public restrooms. And we've already gone through a lot of the design work with them. Um, they have started, we've applied, the town's applied for a number of grants or 
that we have out right now we're waiting to hear back on. And um, I, if those grants don't come through, I believe they have a, they're, they're moving ahead with a fundraising effort as well. Um, so this is a placeholder for that. Rest, for three restrooms down there, open to the public, and the trail, the playground, dog park. Any questions? I thought it was four. Three. Oh. Oh. Three, th three virtually indestructible bathrooms. Okay. <laughs> and before the came. <laughs> yes. Uh, and now our service improvements. And again, I spoke to you about the 50th anniversary of Simsbury Farms before. Um, if you were able to do so and support uh, $7,500 worth of funding, um, that, that money would be used for events, concerts, movies, supplies needed to put those events on um, at, just to celebrate the 50th anniversary. And it would be June through uh, early, early fall. Did we fund, I was just curious, did we do a similar funding for the 350th? There was an 18, I think $18,000. That was a yeah. service improvement yeah. for mm -hmm. that. Okay. Uh, actually, initially, I think we had proposed as a service improvement, and then at the Board of Finances request, I believe we took care of it through a year on transfer during mm -hmm. one budget year. Okay. Is, my, is my vague memory on that. Yeah. So these would be free town events? Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I've just loved what you've done in the past couple of years with the movie nights and similar things that bring oh, the movie together. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we want to take it even better. We want to do a we want to do a movie where you can sit in your inner tube and watch watch a movie from the pool and. Oh my God, Jaws. Jaws. <laughs> 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 maybe, maybe Nemo for the kids. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so so we, we've we've got a lot of ideas, but Mama you know, hit the pool. <laughs> you do that. Yeah. In places. Oh that yeah. Actually, you can sit in the ocean and do it. Yeah, I know. Uh, Suffield did it on their beach. Did, did Jaws on their beach a couple of years ago. Are we bringing back the um, year-end dog swim? Uh, I hope mm. so. Oh, oh, oh please I hope no. so. Yeah. <laughs> we've, got our new, we, we've got our new fencing. So you got, so you got haters and lovers up here. Yeah. Um, Should we raise that fence? Let, let's keep it positive. So we'll move on to the, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, and again, a $7,500 ask here for the Parks and Open Space Pollinator Initiative. Um, Orlando and Brian and Tom have been working closely with the Simsbury Pollinator Group. Um, this money is, is needed for the plantings and uh, work that would need to be done um, to get this going on our end on our property. Any questions? I have a question. Yes. I have a question about the pool, and I don't know if this is something that the Friends is maybe looking at doing, but, you know, it, it comes up every year, the shade issue. Um, and so I just didn't know if that was something that the friends are maybe looking at trying to address or is that just not, I, I, it, yeah, yeah, I don't want to speak, I don't want to speak directly for them, but I know they put, they put some things out on social media back in, uh, over the winter, mm -hmm. um, about shade and there's a lot of interest in it and it's a project they'd like to, they'd like to fund. Mm -hmm. Um, it's expensive and that's a, we, we've, mm -hmm. when we've had some of the vendors come out to the pool deck and start looking at what could be done there, um, and the way our configuration is, it's, it's mm -hmm. beyond what their level of fund, what, but their level of funding is capable of doing right now. Um, Marie and I have talked about funding, or she, she, we're big on shade as well, whether it's a playground or on the pool deck. Um, I think our, our intent is to try to put the, the one back up on the far, the temporary one on the far deck this year mm -hmm. to give people some more shade up there, opportun or opportunities for, for more shade. Um, it's tough. You get some people who really, who really want it and others who don't want it. <laughs> but, but there's no current request right now for us to consider no, about shade. Not at the moment. Can we get a vendor to come in and run umbrellas? Um, that's a good question. We, I think that's the avenue we'd like to do, but if is, yeah, is the umbrellas rather than the big ones? But I think that's what the, the consultant was telling us mm -hmm. over the winter is we, you know, you're almost better going that direction than putting up the right. Like, so. right. Yeah. Um, just I wanted to quickly just clarify Tom's remark. So Amber, if you go to um, tab 26, the CNR plan, yeah, the, out right. the out year, it's it's a it's a bit out. Um, 2526, we do have a placeholder in there for shade structures for the Simsbury Farms complex as well as Rotary Park. Um, those are probably the two areas that we get oh, I would there say the largest okay. number of requests for shade structures. And um, again, it, it's something we've had conversations about, done some preliminary research on. Um, but it's again further further out. Yeah, right. Park. Okay. Just to be clear, people want us to do something about the sun. Shade structures. Yeah, yeah. the sun. Okay. That's, so. that's been there for the last fifty years. Yeah, that thing in the that sky I suffered with too. There. Yeah. Okay. It's the farms. Okay. Do we have anything more, Melissa? Did we, did we finish I, I want to thank you for the hour and half of your support. <laughs> no, I appreciate your time and the, and the opportunity to talk to you about this. And obviously, I'll be, I'll be here and my staff will be here if you have any other questions. And I want to thank Tom and the other departments who have patiently been waiting. I think we're going to take a break. Yes. If we have any questions after, you'll be here. But what do you think?
10 minutes? Is that what we normally would do? 5, 10 for the quick. It'll probably turn into, we'll say less because it'll be more. Okay. We're going to take a break. Okay.